welcome to the Lover's Hole. As usual, you're with Mike and Ian as we read back through the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien, our favorite author. Ian, last week in Chapter 9 of The Wine Dark Sea, where were we and what are we going to be up to this week? Mike, my pleasure to catch us up here. Last time... We were back at sea. After a couple of chapters of being up in the mountains, Tom Pullings had managed to rescue Jack and the crew of the wrecked launch. Sam Panda, meanwhile, had told Jack the outcome of Stephen's mission and of Stephen's plan to go ahead and meet the surprise in Valparaiso. He, Stephen, had escaped through the High Andes. He'd had this terrible dream about Diana, got stuck overnight in a high-pass avalanche. It got frostbite and... Eduardo, the guy, had said that he was going to carry Stephen over ancient Inca rope bridges and chasms in a Peruvian chair. This time, we're going to cover the first half of chapter 10. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're hoping to get all the way to the end of the book, uh, we're not quite there yet. We've got a lot to talk about in this 10th chapter. This time, we're going to talk about Jack looking for Stephen, Stephen taking to the sea, and we'll hear about exactly how. A chase that has a beast in view, to reuse a famous quote. There are tips for handling frostbite. There's a different kind of sneer. There's Inca gold, lightning, lots of ice, and ships both expected and unexpected. But even so, no more of Stephen's mission. Lots to get into this week. We just wanted to mention a conversation we've been having on YouTube that we've really enjoyed that takes us back to some of the conversation we had last week. We were talking about Eduardo and how we love these secondary characters that O'Brien paints for us, a conversation that we're going to come back to in a couple of other contexts quite soon as well. And uh, Special Agent Fox Mulder, one of our most prolific commenters on YouTube, gave us this really great comment a couple of weeks back. Mulder says, I definitely think Dickens played a big part in O'Brien's secondary character development and memorable moments, particularly Oliver Twist. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. We're right there with you. Another couple, I suspect, says Fox Mulder, are John Steinbeck and Arthur Conan Doyle. Steinbeck because of his writing about minorities and women, and Conan Doyle for that very detached plot building and this uh, writerly trick of finding important details after the fact. So Fox Mulder. Thank you very much. We think you're absolutely on the money there when it comes to secondary characters. We're going to miss Eduardo, I think, but I'm sure we're going to see this Dickensian character building style coming to the fore again in O'Brien's writing really soon. So thank you. And thank you to all of the YouTube viewers. There's a whole community out there of folks who are listening but watching on YouTube. And we really appreciate your uh, your your participation and your likes and your subscribes. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and Fox, you know, thanks for always reminding us that the truth is out there. <laughs> so meanwhile, back on the surprise, it's 11.30 a.m., or as most of you would say, seven bills in the forenoon watch. And the officers have gathered on the quarterdeck, of course, to take the noon sighting. You know, they're going to use their sun to fix the position. But doing so, O'Brien writes, you know, at the extreme western end of Valparaiso Bay, whose position had been laid down with the utmost accuracy, time out of mind, and surrounded by other well-known, well-established landmarks, might to a landlubber, you know, seem a bit absurd. But Jack, of course, runs his man of war as all men of war have always been run, and he intends to establish noon the exact same way, the start of the naval day. It's the way that it's always been done, and on this day, particularly for Jack, the last day of the month, and the first day he can hope to find Stephen Maturin here in Valparaiso, he does not want to break any patterns or do anything to bring ill luck. You know, luck, that continuing theme, superstition, that continuing theme here. <laughs> well, Jack, too, says, you know, he's taken a long time to teach Stephen that it's noon that starts the day. And, you know, Jack has no use for what he describes as that wild enthusiast, a Whiggish civilian, no doubt who's argued that the new day should start at midnight. Well, Mm -hmm. the ceremony proceeds. They make it noon, strike eight bells, turn the glass, and with a great roar, the surprises rush for their salt pork and an extraordinary plum duff today in honor of Lord Melville's birthday. And O'Brien reminds us, Lord Melville, the brother of Captain Aubrey's particular friend, Hennage Dundas, And Melville, the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time of Jack's reinstatement. 
Yeah, very good. There's an opportunity here, Mike, isn't there, to stick a pin in something, stick a bit of a pin in Lord Melville, and stick a pin in Henry Dundas, who's not been mentioned at all for nine and a half chapters, and now here he is. Hmm. Hmm. So, Mike, Jack, meanwhile, tells Mr. Adams, after they've taken their Humboldt readings and they've taken a deep water sounding, that they're going to take the ship a little bit further in. And Adams is going to be set away to take the cutter to look like he's calling for mail and to check the addresses in Valparaiso where the doctor might be found. Jack says this calls for the utmost discretion and this is why he's not taking the surprise further in. He doesn't want her to be seen from on shore. And he comes up with this very cosy but disreputable cover story for Adams to use. He says real close and, and, and quietly, he says, you will not repeat it. But there appears to be some question of a high-placed, very furious husband, legal proceedings. Every kind of unpleasantness, you understand me. Which is great. And of course, the, the crew are all nodding along because they think that they know that Stephen is, is a bit of a player in the uh, in the wenches on shore category. And they're all wrong. But it's a great way of keeping up the uh, it, the, the, the character of him not really being an intelligence agent. Right. And Mike, I, I really like the description of the deep water sounding here with all the coils up on deck and they splash the coils into the water from the bow of the boat to the stern and i'm pretty sure this is an authentic way that you take a deep sea sounding because you've got to find a way to get the lead all the way to the bottom and know that you've got the rope tight before you can say yeah okay we've got a, a good sounding here and of course they don't there's no bottom even with the deep sea lead so that means that they're still very very far offshore um reed reports this back and says maybe captain you should look over on the larboard beam. And Reed has a very important couple of lines of dialogue for our plot here. He says, There is as odd a craft as you could possibly imagine, a balsa, I think, sailing in the strangest way. It has been brought by the Lee three times in the last five minutes, and the poor soul seems to be entangled in his sheet. He's a brave fellow to come on, but he has no more notion of handling a boat than the doctor. Jack takes a look. Uh, sends Norton up with a glass, uh, orders the red cutter to be lowered at once, and Norton confirms exactly what Reed had just started to plant in our brains. It's the doctor! <laughs> so by the time that they've started all of this, they've observed him doing yet more hijinks in the boat. He's gone overboard, he's gotten back in, the tillers come unshipped. Uh, again, stick a pin in the idea of failed steering gear, Mike. <laughs> But it's really great. I, I don't think I was yet really super worried about Stephen, but it's a really great moment for this reunion to happen and really unexpected as well. And, and it's funny, O'Brien says that Stephen's balsa, though by definition unsinkable, is so overlaid that it may have sunk. So yeah. it, it sounds like quite the craft. I remember making little boats out of balsa wood as a yeah. kid. You know, this idea that they, they'll float, they'll float here. Well, Everyone is delighted to have him back. We're delighted to have him back. And they're so delighted that they almost pitch him into the waist as they're getting him on board as the crowd around them huzzahs here. And Stephen, of course, you know, being who Stephen is, immediately kind of whisked Jack off to the cabin to take a look at those wounds that he did not want to leave behind here. And he's pleased overall, but he says he needs better light to examine that one eye, that, that eye still troubling Jack here. He asked Jack if Jack would like to know why he, Stephen, came out in what, you know, might be called such a fast and reckless manner. Jack says, of course I do. And Stephen said he did not want to get the surprise noticed. So there's one little seed that O'Brien gives us here. And he adds he has some information that Jack might want to act upon and Stephen's words without the loss of a minute. I think Stephen always enjoys when he gets to be the one that says that. <laughs> oh, yes. And we enjoy it as well. This is the kind of message that we know Jack Aubrey loves to respond to. Stephen explains, knowing, of course, that others can hear the conversation. So he's explaining it in terms that don't disclose his intelligence activities. He had left Peru because of the unjustified suspicions of a military man who misunderstood my examination of his wife. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that's the usual cover story for what they call Stephen's licentious capers already understood and accepted by the crew who were happy to go kind of go along with this, as we said. He describes how a confidential friend had told him about three American China ships sailing from Boston with information on their insurance coverage, their ports of call, their timing, and their progress. 
and heading from Boston to China, they're going to go around Cape Horn in the opposite direction to the way that Surprise is headed right now. Huh. So in Valparaiso itself, Stephen had received an update. On Candlemas Day, they had cleared Buenos Aires. Candlemas Day, Mike, I think just about a week ago. We'll come back to Candlemas in a second. Right. But we, we're sitting here at the beginning of February, early February, writing this. It's just about Candlemas time right now. On that day, they cleared Buenos Aires. They're going to traverse the Straits Le Maire as they go around the Horn and will be south of the Diego Ramirez Islands, which are just to the west of Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost tip of South America, by the end of the month before turning northeast for Canton. Stephen says, if we, in the surprise, spread every sail and strain every nerve, we might just get there in time. And Mike, it, it, it's a, a nice little notice here of the day of Candlemas. Yeah, it, this you know Candlemas. This was this is you know new for me, and this is interesting. You know, you you and I have talked about this a little bit since then. You know, celebrated on February second marks the return of the light, a symbol of the protection and prosperity. Um, the, the Christian festival celebrates the presentation of Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem, referring to him as the light of the people of Israel. And many Christians in, in older days would take their candles on this day to be blessed so that they yeah. would provide light and serve as a symbol of Jesus for the rest of the year. So, you know, this was this was a new one for me. I've grown up in that more evolved American tradition of Groundhog Day as, as kind of a, <laughs> a celebration of, you know, the, the coming spring and everything. But I love this. I love this candle mass here. And this idea of protection and prosperity sounds like a great day to get this good intelligence and to be kind of, you know, updating on our quarry. Although I wonder sometimes who's protected and, and who's prospering here. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And th there's another interesting connection to Candlemas as well. Candlemas is one of the uh, the quarter days. So in English and also I think Welsh and also I think Irish law, there we have the and, and in Scottish law as well, although the days are named differently. We have these quarter days, and the day at the end of the quarter is the day on which your rent is due if you're a tenant, and it's the ah. day on which you expect rent from your tenants if you're a landowner. These dates are kind of baked into the way the legal system works as well, the legal calendar. These dates are baked into the way that the taxation system works as well. So it's because of the old structure of quarter days, that's the reason why British people oh. account their taxes on the year beginning April 1st, because it's just after Lady Day, which is the quarter day for quarter one. And besides a quarter day for the end of the quarter, there are also dates for the middles of the quarters, and Candlemas is the mid-quarter day for the first quarter of the traditional British legal calendar year. Wow. The other ones are the cross-quarter days are Candlemas, Whitsun, Lammas, and Martinmas. The full-quarter days are Lady Day, Midsummer Day, Michaelmas, and Christmas. So with this kind of connection to the legal establishment, I wonder if also we're getting a hint of Stephen reminding himself about his worldly connection and his property and his obligations and his family and his wife back home. Uh, coincidentally as well, just checking in the calendar Candlemas is also the same as in in, in Ireland St Bridget's Day, and Ooh. maybe that's not a coincidence either. Right. Oh, I I love that St Bridget connection. So definitely, you know, this is going to ring pretty strong for Stephen here. Yeah, I think so. Well, Jack is pretty excited, as you'd said, Ian, about this news here. And before they just go tearing off, he asked Stephen, "What should be done with all these boxes and chests and bundles on the boat?" And Stephen says, well, that bad-tempered boat can be just, you know, tossed overboard, can be thrown away. But he asked that all his things be brought aboard very carefully. He'd had so many specimens to bring from his trip through the mountains that there was no room for them in the boat. And once he packed all of those in, he didn't have any room. So he almost fell into the sea several times. And Jack says, well, why didn't you take kind of the worst of them and throw them overboard? And Stephen says, well, you know, the monks, they tied everything down tight and then the ropes got wet. And he says, and, and the worst, the worst that was tied particularly tight was my flightless Tittycocka grebe. And then ah. there, there's this <laughs> line. He said, you would never have expected me to throw away a flightless grebe for all love. So I, I know this is not Jack, you've debauched my sloth, but, but I love this line here. Uh, it's so Stephen. It's so Jack. It's so O'Brien with a little potty humor here. In the oh, home yes. of here. And besides, Stephen continues, and, and this again, so Stephen, 
The monks had promised to pray for me, and with no more than moderate skill, I survived. <laughs> we've, we've already had Reed's commentary on how much skill the doctor has on water there. And Jack then asked Stephen if he thinks he can manage some dinner. And Stephen says, any dinner at all. So Brian writes, with great conviction, you know, he, he explains that the monetary had been in a deep penitential fast. So he's starving. He's so hungry, he says he would even eat a guinea pig. Yeah, we that, know how he doesn't like those. <laughs> right. And besides having a comedy name, this Titicaca Grebe, what do we think? Is that a real world reference? Well, it, you know, it turns out that it absolutely is. It's, in fact, a real grebe. It's the kind of grebe found only in the Altiplano of Peru huh. and Bolivia, particularly in Lake Titicaca, real lake here. So, O'Brien, oh, you amaze me here. They cannot fly. They are indeed flightless, but they do use their wings to run considerable distances. So they use them to kind of help propel them in their running. Now, and O'Brien's oh, absolutely right on too. This would have been a great interest to Stephen since it wasn't officially described in London until 1868. So, Maybe we can show some of these real world birds out in social media with a, a link or so if we get an opportunity. Sounds great. Very good. Well, true to his promise, Stephen has no difficulty at all in doing justice to the dinner. He eats wolfishly and he gets talking about his botanizing journey that he's been on from Lima to Arica. He talks about getting frostbitten. And now, Mike, of course, in traditional O'Brien style, after the event, secondhand, we discover how the story had played out. Last time, he had been frostbitten leg, promised to be carried off the mountain in a chair by Eduardo, and now we find out how it had all gone. He had thought that he was going to lose the leg. He thought the leg below the knee was going to have to be amputated. He'd ended up, he says, to his relief, only taking off a couple of unimportant toes, which he'd taken off ugh, with a chisel to prevent the gangrene mm. from spreading. And I love the fact that it, it, it went quiet in the room as he's describing this. He points out to Reed that an ostrich lives its entire life with only two toes, and therefore as long as you've got the big toe and the little toe, a human can be said somehow to be okay with fewer toes. Oh, my gosh. Stephen goes on and describes the Inca chair that Eduardo had promised him, a framework, he says, fitting over a man's chest fore and aft. And he's very, very proud of his use of the phrase fore and aft. <laughs> and he repeats it with this, with this certain satisfaction. And Eduardo and the other porters had carried Stephen on their shoulders, him sitting easy, facing backwards through the mountains over these terrible swinging in Inca bridges, which, by the way, I was looking forward to hearing about, and I'm slightly right. miffed that we haven't heard about these. Anyway, never mind. Eduardo walking beside him, telling him about the magnificence of ancient Peru, except where there was the precipice that meant the path was not wide enough for two people. And, you know, my head swims a little bit Ooh. with the idea of what this journey might have been like. The Taking your toes off with a chisel, that's got the cold-blooded Stephen kind of matter-of-factness about it. And it reminds me as well of something that happened in, in the real world, so I, I'm sure after O'Brien was writing. Uh, but there's a famous British explorer called Sir Ranulph Fiennes. He's the cousin of the actor Joseph Fiennes, if you've ever seen Joseph Fiennes on the TV. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in the year 2000, uh, Ranulph Fiennes attempted to walk solo to the North Pole, and the expedition failed. And he got rescued. He had severe frostbite to the tips of all the fingers on his left hand. And when he got Ooh. home, uh, they were trying to wait for these uh, frostbitten fingers to heal. But he decided to go ahead and amputate them himself because they were so painful. So Ronald finds in the year 2000 cut off his own fingertips with an electric fret saw at home just above where the tissue is damaged. And that was the kind of ugh moment that I was reminded of with Stephen and his story about the chisel. Wow. Oh. Well, we we moved from chiseled toes and fret sawed fingers to uh, pulling, saying, you know, Doctor, tell us about the magnificence of Peru. And, and Stephen describes one Inca ruler who had this great gold chain made. Yeah, he was going to celebrate the birth of his son. There was this ancient ceremonial dance, but the dance required the dancers to all be holding hands. And that was now in this time of the Incas thought to be improper, something that might lead to irregularities, they write. I don't yeah. know, Victorian <laughs> Inca maybe. So, you know, so instead he was going to have this chain fashioned and the dancers would hold this big gold chain to stay in their proper formation. 
Uh, as, as it was described to him, the links were as thick as a man's wrist. The chain was twice the length of the great square of Cusco. So it was in all over 700 feet. And it weighed so much when it was completed that 200 Indians could barely lift it from the ground. And this just blows everybody at the table away. They are all going, yeah. oh, including we hear from the background, Killigan is mate, you know, weighing in. They're obviously listening in here along with who else we don't know here. And young Weddell comes in with Mr. Granger's compliments, asking if he might set the weather studding sails. Jack says, oh, by all means, Mr. Weddell, let him crack on till all sneers again. And Ian, we, we've seen this phrase so many <laughs> times in so many books. And I finally just said to myself, crack on till all sneers again. What could this possibly mean? And I found out that, you know, Google Engram 1835 yeah. makes sense. So this, this is right in there. And it sounds like it's a common phrase, but I just was having a really hard time finding it. And, and I went to, you know, just all kinds of far-flung lengths and, and tried to come up with some obtuse explanation. But you did me way, way better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. The this this phrase crack, crack on clearly means keep keep going it's used in it's a, maybe it's a britishism it's used these days it's an especially military term that kind of means just keep pressing on regardless so to crack on and it's used over and over in the text to mean just piling on extra sail to keep the momentum to keep the pace going even if it means taking a risk and till all sneers is a really odd formulation like you said mike we dug hard for whether this is a a nautical term from somewhere and the idea of sneering as a kind of facial expression didn't seem to fit either. But way back in Post Captain, we got a clue, I think, about what he might have intended because he used a similar phrase. In Post Captain, he said, crack on until she groans again. Mm. So I haven't got any certainty about this, but it seems to me that maybe this word sneer in this kind of context is in some ancient nautical dictionary or source known only to Patrick O'Brien. Uh, and it's a word that describes the noise that's made by the spars and the sails when the rigging is overpressed. So this sneer might refer to the groan that the ship makes. And maybe it might, it's also a bit of a, a visual metaphor as well. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I could, I could definitely see us kind of anthropomorphizing the sails and seeing them yeah. go ah, and just sneering at, at, at being mistreated like this. So, you know, and this phrase, which you know, when I went back and looked, had come up so many times. I was glad we finally played with that. Now, listeners, if you've got a little more insight on making all sneer again, by all means, please let us know. And then. Speaking of familiar lines, O'Brien goes right on after that to tell us that from then on, the entire ship knew, in his words, the captain's chase had a beast in view. And, and now everybody is, is all enthusiastic about getting the barky sailing more briskly into the high southern latitude. So, yeah. Ian, we've heard this phrase before, haven't we? The chase being a beast in view? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, I think... From my counting here is the fourth outing for this quote from the Dryden poem, The Secular Mask, which we certainly got in Post Captain, maybe even before then. And it's a, an O'Brien touch point that he clearly loves to go back and pick up again. Well, let, let's get back to Stephen's news about losing not a minute. We know, and the crew knows, that Stephen is often the guy who picks up valuable news from ashore. And Certain phrases are often heard on the lower deck. And here we've got the crew murmuring and gossiping to each other. They keep repeating, mm, two or three ships, two or three China ships out of Boston and south of Diego Ramirez. So it sounds like they're attaching a lot of credence and a lot of importance to this intelligence that the doctors brought. The crew have figured out, because they can all navigate as well, that a steady five knots a day will get them there. And clearly they've learned from all the eavesdroppings of Killick and all of his mates as well. And the crew get on to talking about what this might mean. They colour and accentuate the idea of the prizes, along with Stephen's story about the great gold Inca chain. Even though the two stories are not connected, there's no suggestion that the prize ships might contain gold, but they get associated in the mind of the crew, who are very, very willing to think about the association here. Reed and Weddell 
attempt to work out what the value of such a chain would be. And they make this series of assumptions about the size and the thickness and the weight and the number and the length, eventually concluding there's not enough room on Reed's slate to calculate it, but it's over two millions of money, two million pounds. And even though every crew member right now as this is going on is richer than they'd ever been from the current prices that they've made, the potential prizes are really glowing brighter and going more charming in the light of this story about the gold chain. Too funny. I I, I just love this with everybody that way. And, and we find out that it's not just the crew that somehow, you know, kind of wrapped up in all this prize taking again. Later in the cabin, we hear there's something profoundly discreditable about this delight in taking other men's property away from them by force, observes Stephen tuning his long-neglected cello, taking it openly, legally, and being praised, caressed, and even decorated for doing so. I quell, or attempt to quell, the feeling every time it rises in my bosom, which it does quite often. So oh. he, <laughs> the Stephen, confession is good for the soul, right? <laughs> oh, is it? It's so true. I love <laughs> it. This, you know, this allure of prizes, which... You know, we, we've spent so much of this book talking about all these divisions and differences between people. But what yeah. we find is, is taking a prizes, you know, even somebody like Stephen, who's got this inherited great fortune, he's got certainly a lion's share of the new prizes. He's got a moral predisposition against taking these things, finds them a very exciting temp, uh, temptation. And then, Ian, we turn to something that always warms our heart here. You know, what do these guys do? We heard that Stephen's fitting with his cello. He hasn't touched it for a while. And where do they go? Well, they're going to play. And guess what they're going to play? They're going to play some Boccherini. So yay for Boccherini. We don't have to dig for which one. It's just some old Boccherini. And you can imagine whichever piece of Boccherini in your head at this point. It's Allegro Vivace. And there's plenty of Boccherini with that tempo marking. After they're done... Jack tells Stephen that he won't see him in the morning, but he, Stephen, should remember that uh, Jack's going to be a guest in the gun room and therefore briefs Stephen and therefore us, the readers, of what's been going on in the gun room. Uh, Mike, you mentioned just a second ago that we've moved on a little bit, it seems, from some of the divisions and the prejudices that were aboard the ship. And this is sort of bearing out in the population of the gun room. Fidal and two of his nipper dolling cousins have left the ship. We don't get a description of quite why, but we can remember not that many chapters ago that there was a suspicion that they'd been involved in helping Dutour to escape. Meanwhile, William Sadler had replaced Vidal. Some new guy called John Proby, who we haven't heard of until now, had lost the number of his mess, had been killed. Stephen had known this and was glad that Fabian, the other servant, had saved Proby's hand. Another grisly moment of Stephenism here had saved Proby's hand for Stephen to examine, and he's very interested in looking at the calcification of the sinews of his hand. And again, a, a little quiet moment for Jack, because he's very, very uneasy about Stephen's ghoulish surgical and anatomical dissections that he likes to do. And meanwhile, also, the purser bulkily has gone. And we're going to have a couple of old naval customs coming up in the next couple of paragraphs. Uh, here's one. Uh, we hear that bulkily had been indulging the old naval habit of what Jack calls Kappa Bar, which is helping yourself to the ship's perquisites, including marine stores not immovably screwed down, had been preyed on by Bulkley, including their best Snow Harris lightning conductor. And Mike, we've had Geneva cyanographs and we've had Humboldt's salinity and temperature readings. A Snow Harris lightning conductor? Is this a real thing or were we made up here? absolutely real thing here, perhaps a little anachronistic, but real. Sir William Snow Harris. It was a British physician, electrical researcher, nicknamed Thunder and Lightning Harris, and noted for his invention of a successful system of lightning conductors for ships. But huh. it took many, many years of campaigning and researching and successfully testing before the Royal British Navy changed to Harris's conductors from their previous, uh, much less effective system. Now, interestingly, one of the successful test vessels was HMS Beagle, which huh. survived a number of lightning strikes unharmed on her famous voyage with Charles Darwin. So, wow. uh, Now, we know that Ben Franklin invented the lightning rod in 1752, but Harris did not invent his new ship system until 1820. 
So we're just a little bit after the fictional date of this book anyway. So maybe an anachronism, but great fun. Yeah. yeah. If only Harris had had the presence of mind to go kite flying in a thunderstorm, then he would have taken care of this all a lot quicker. <laughs> That's right. Oh. <laughs> Well, the, the talk of lightning continues the next day in the gun room at this said dinner. Uh, the officers at first are a bit worried that talking shop, which is described as an act less criminal than sodomy, which carried the death sentence, but not very much so, following the captain's example, had decided that the topic was just on the correct side of the shop talk barrier. And almost all of the members of the gun room and the guests at the dinner, including Jack and Stephen and Tom Pullings and Adams, had had some quarter deck experience. Wilkins, who was there as well, had been a midshipman or a master's mate on half a dozen king's ships. And Granger, along with his brother-in-law Sadler, had all taken along on what O'Brien calls the local colour in the most natural way. And right at the beginning of the book, we heard how there was, you know, not everybody's part of the same social tone in the gun room. But it turns out that with a bit of accommodation and a bit of getting to know each other, actually the tone has kind of evened out in the gun room and everybody's happy to get along. There's much more free speech now than when the merchants and ransomers had been aboard because now we've got people who've all got a naval background. And of course, everybody's speaking more freely as the surprise is homeward bound. And Mike, I, I love this next part. They're all telling stories about lightning strikes, having gone from the Snow Harris lightning conductor. They're talking about lightning strikes and Jack introduces a story of a strike aboard, the surprise herself, and then they all pile on. Each telling a, a follow-up story of lightning that was increasingly spectacular and deadly. Oh, I was one where somebody got burned. Oh, I was in a lightning strike where two people got killed. That's nothing. I was in a lightning strike where, you know, half the folks all were dead and we had to bury them all at sea. Uh, by the way, they're also taking care of the day on which lightning struck because they're still superstitious mariners. They're not, they're not scientists like Ben Franklin. Anyhow, I, I like this because this is an old naval custom. One upmanship trying to top the story told by the previous storyteller. Conversational tactic, common everywhere. Common, especially amongst men, I think. Common, right. especially right. much, amongst the men of the Royal Navy. So there's a phrase for it in Royal Navy slang. This is called black catting. Ah. And if you like this, there's a Twitter, a parody Twitter account dedicated to exactly this topic. Uh, it's called HMS Massive. Go online, search for HMS Massive on Twitter. The tagline for HMS Massive is, you saw dolphins? We saw mermaids. <laughs> you went to Tenerife. We went to Elevenerife. So <laughs> they're all indulging in a bit of this. So if this was the 20th century Navy, I think that the black catting response to yet another lightning story is to go, lightning, pa. I saw bigger sparks when we changed the battery on the chief petty officer's spare number two laser pointer. That's how you deal with a black catting. <laughs> And for those of you who are Monty Python fans, this also sounds to me a little bit like the famous four Yorkshiremen sketch where people are bragging about how really poor they were. But uh, we, we can follow that one up later. We should put that up on social media. I yeah. love that. <laughs> That's great. So, Mike, after all this, they're finally done talking about lightning, right? They are. They are. And, and they move on to a more general observations until the main course arrives, a suckling pig. And, you know, then, of course, the talk turns to pigs. <laughs> and so we had pigs we've known, observations about pigs. And by the time they reach the port, homeward bound is coming up more and more often. And there's they're, they're full of conjectures about changes in their families, things that might be different at home. And all agree that it's great to have pockets full of prize money and that it's great to be homeward bound. But it's best to be homeward bound with lots of prize money. Oh, now, yes. Yeah, Jack interrupts them all, though, with a, an excellent Aubreyism. He says, come, gentlemen, do not let us tempt fate. Do not let us say anything presumptuous that may prove unlucky. We must not sell the bear skin before we've locked the stable door and locked it with a double turn. <laughs> oh, it's great. This, this is an Aubreyism of Aubreyisms, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So um, if you want interested in the list of these Aubreyisms, of which this is a classic example, uh, the gun room of HMS Surprise, hmssurprise.org, has got a great list of all of these, and this is one of the top ones, I think. Now, Jack here adds that he won't regret it if they don't meet any ships off the horn. He's kind of setting their expectations a little bit here. He says, we have to pass that way in any case, and if our hurry makes us no richer, why, it carries us home the sooner. 
I long to see my new plantations. And maybe this is Jack taking care not to be too presumptuous. I think he's going to fail because I think everybody's getting focused on the idea of these prizes here. Um, Stephen is sounding a bit of a note of caution here. He doesn't really like the prospect of rounding the horn, doesn't really like the idea of being too hasty to get there. He says it's been an exceptional year for the weather. He says cranes have been flying north over Lima, which clearly means a lot to him. The weather, he says, is sure to be more disagreeable than ever. And Adams is having none of it. Adams is all about the optimism and the idea of the prize. He says, this time of year, if we crack on, it'll be the ideal time. You could round the horn, he says, with barely a ripple. And this is cutting no ice with Stephen, still worried about his collections. This is the same Stephen who's had, you know, moldy squid in the forepeak of ships in the past. He knows what the potential cost is to his set of collections. He says he needs several weeks of calm to get everything described and oiled and perfectly packed for the weather to withstand a rounding of Cape Horn. And Jack says that, well, maybe these cranes flying overhead have lost their heads, he says, but the anti-trade winds are blowing us as sweetly as their best friends could wish. And Jack, foolishly, without grasping any belaying pins, says that he promises several weeks of good weather for Stephen to do his packing. Uh, Mike, uh, j- just to pause for a second here, I- I'm scratching my head as I get to this point in the chapter. We had all of the darkness and danger and the introspection of Stephen up high in the mountains in the last two chapters, and all of this suspense about you know what's going to happen with the plan to overthrow Peru, what's going to happen with Stephen being betrayed, and this chapter, we've got this whole lighthearted thing with Stephen being rescued and the banter in the gun room here. And I'm just wondering, what, what's going on here? Are we going to crash out of the whole Chile, Peru revolutionary mission, having built it up for so long? Are we just going to have some flippant, like minor stuff happening to round the book off? I, I can't work out what's going on. I'm scratching my head a little bit at O'Brien and, and what he might be up to in this last chapter. Yeah, I, I I have to admit, Ian, I I I listened to this with Patrick Tall, and then I listened again, and I listened again, and then I went back and read it, and I was thinking, because you know, some of the times the way I was like, whoa, 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 how many books have we been leading up to this? Yeah. You know, we've been waiting and anticipating, and you're telling me this is all over, it's all done here. Not to mention, as you said, all of that tension in Peru and, and you know, the survival at the pass. And now we're going to be going over the Indian bridges in this chair. And, you know, all we get at the end of that is, hey, it was great riding in the chair. You know, oh, by the way, no hassle getting out of the Peruvian port instead of going on to Chile like we were. Worried. No hassle yeah. with all of Eduardo's relatives in this whole plot, secondary plot there. Just done. And, and once in Chile, the place that was supposedly ripe for Stephen's mission, what, we're no longer interested in it? No. Um, you know, right. <laughs> oh, Stephen says, well, I had my reasons to Jack for not getting the surprise notice. So maybe there's something there, but I don't know. I mean, you know, it would make sense that, you know, Spain had gotten hold of the intelligence that the surprise was there to subvert Spanish interests. And now Stephen's been called out as a British agent. So uh, we don't do that. Or maybe we leave, come back later. I don't know. But I, I, I'm with you, Ian. There's just seems to be a lot of everything just going lovely. It's all nice. I was reminded of John Grissom, who whose novels I love. Yeah. A lot of times, yeah. though, I would feel like I just got tired of writing them and just thought, okay, I'm going to finish this one. And yeah. and after so many books, I thought, don't don't do that, O'Brien. Don't just finish yeah. this one. Yeah, let's get back to this a little bit. Yeah especially with all the big character questions that we've been carrying with us about Stephen and about Diana and about Clarissa. I mean, you know, anyway, let's see. This week, Mike, we're only doing the first half of chapter 10. So maybe, maybe it's going to get better. Maybe we're going to have some more story resolutions in the second half of the final chapter. But there's a lot riding on this. There is. Well, and and we've still got a little bit more in the first half of chapter 10. Maybe we we should just take a pause. You know, we've just gotten to the port at the end of dinner here, I suggest maybe we all head off a little port, a little something to refresh yourself, and we'll be right back. I'm I'm gonna go check out my walnuts right now. (laughs) If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole.
Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed your port on walnuts. Maybe you got a little sliver of Stilton on the side there to keep you going through the second half of nice. this episode. We're in part one of chapter 10. We get, as promised, as trailed for us, uh, two weeks of pure sailing, 200 miles a day, which, by the way, is comfortably five knots that the crew had been hoping for. Fabian's beautiful watercolours of Stephen's specimens are captured in their full glory. We get evenings of music, including presumably Boccherini. We get fresh fish dinners. We get penguins as companions here as we're sailing along this cold water current into the true Antarctic. Everyone's getting the ship ready. We've got heavier sails, heavier clothing. Jack's favorite seamanship stunt, the heavy preventer backstays are going up and being set out by this very, very seaman-like crew. They serve out winter gear, winter clothing on Tuesday, and then by Friday, they're tearing eastwards, the text says, with four men at the wheel, snow blurring both binnacles, hatches battened down, and the muffled watch on deck sheltering in the waist, dreading a call to grapple with the frozen rigging and the board stiff sails. Mm. In case you're wondering, ah, did Stephen's collections get taken care of? The answer is yes. Stephen's collections are protected and packed. They're down in the hold, along with all of these great provisions that Mr. Adams had laid in. Rather than following the penny-pinching rules of traditional Royal Navy service, Mr. Adams has basically eaten into the surprise's generous profit pool for the voyage and has done the crew proud. They're well provisioned with high quality marine stores. They've got food and drink, plenty to spare. And this is a good thing because in this really deathly chill, even colder in this unusual year, most of the hands, almost always wet and cold, are as a result upping their calorie count. So they're eating far more than usual. And Mike, it's interesting as well that we had cold as a feature of the environment for Stephen up high in the mountains, and now we've yeah. got cold as a feature of the environment here down at sea level in the Pacific. Yeah, and that cold in the mountains, certainly jeopardy for Stephen. Yeah. We've been here in these latitudes before. Certainly there's been jeopardy for the surprise and Leopard and others before. And even now, you know, this thick weather sets in for days. Jack's really not sure of his latitude or longitude because dead reckoning is just hard to do here. It's uncertain seas, uncertain winds. They're moving eastward at no more than three knots, sometimes under bare poles with just a small scrap of sail forward for steerage way. And in full gales from the west at times, they're caught sometimes in the Antarctica calms. And they take advantage of these to exercise the great guns, having made special provisions for the guns in weather to keep them ready to go at a second's notice. And after the second great gun exercise, the sky clears and Jack realizes they've reached the rendezvous far too soon here. Uh oh. Yeah. They're three days into the new moon and the ships aren't due until the full moon or just after. And so, as O'Brien writes, that would mean a great deal of beating to and fro in the most inhospitable seas known to man, with no more than a passable likelihood of success after all. That likelihood of success is diminished by unpredictable wind, unpredictable weather, the state of the sea, and the difference between a merchantman's predictability and that of a kingship. So, Jack's concluded they're just going to have to stand off and on until the full moon gets here. Yeah. So they've got, by, by my rough calculation, if my lunar calendar is right, they've got 10 days of time to kill in this super inhospitable natural environment here. Wow. Stephen is not at all pleased by the prospect of this hanging around. The ships have to kind of lie to in the water here. The erratic jerking from kind of lying in these waves makes it impossible for him to play his cello or eat his soup. There are bruises and broken bones among the crew as people fall from the rigging or slip on the icy decks. And he asks Jack if it wouldn't be better to go home. And I, I like this little bantering conversation between Jack and Stephen here. Right. Wouldn't it be better to go home, asks Stephen. Yes, says Jack. It often occurs to me, but then my innate nobility of character cries out, Hey, Jack Aubrey, you mind your duty. Do you hear me there? You know about duty, Stephen. I believe I've heard it well spoken of. Well, it exists. So <laughs> they're both teasing each other. Uh, Jack believes, as he goes on and describes the situation here, it's his duty to distress the king's enemies, even though the enemies are American. And he reflects that he and Stephen had been well treated by the Americans in Boston. Moreover, 
it's his duty to all the crew members who've worked so hard to get them there, who are all now hoping for three China ships as prizes, you know, with or without gold aboard. They're not men of war's men, they're privateers. And what would he say, he asks, if Jack says, be damned to your three China ships? Mm. No. Stephen's not going to let this go. He says, well, these Americans that you're talking about defeating here, they're capital seamen. They beat us soundly in the Java. And he wonders if a tracking three of America's China ships together might be a bit rash. Does it not smack, he says, of that pride which goeth before destruction? Nice little biblical quote there. Well done, Stephen. Right. Jack assures Stephen that these are not solid great Indiamen, not large company ships like a man of war. These are going to be modest private merchantmen with, he says, a few six-pounders and swivels and small arms just to beat off the pirates of the South China Sea. They won't have a man of war's crew and can't fire a full broadside, even if they had the guns, which Jack says they don't. And bringing this all to a conclusion, he says, they're no match for even a quite small frigate capable of firing three well-directed 144-pound broadsides in under five minutes. And, Mike, I I think this Stephen is willing to concede the point. Yeah, he's not only willing to concede the point, but it also has, you know, a little something else in mind here. He suggests that if they have to wait for what he calls your more or less mythical Chinaman, and part of me is going, Stephen, this was all your idea. This is your intelligence. This was your, you know, we got to leave, not a minute to lose. But you know, you're more or less mythical Chinaman. If they do have to wait, perhaps they could spend some time going south to the edge of the ice so Stephen can get a better look at it. How charming that would be, says Stephen. And Jack replies, with all due respect, Stephen, I must tell you that I utterly decline to go anywhere near any ice whatsoever, however thin however deeply laden with seals, great auks, and other wonders of the deep. I hate and despise ice. Ever since our mortal time with the ice island and the horrible old leopard, I have always sworn never to give it any countenance. And then there's this pause. My dear, said Stephen, pouring him another glass of wine, how well a graceful timidity does become you. Oh, my God. (laughs) What a burn from yeah. Stephen. And I'm wondering, how in the world is Jack going to respond to that one? Woo. Yeah. And, and in all of this conversation, nobody's been touching any belaying pins at all. All of them tempting fate in their different ways. The next day, <laughs> the, 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 the paragraph begins, Stephen Maturin had little room to prate about timidity because Stephen's going to have to face his own limitations of his own physical courage here. Jack has set up the next day a crow's nest filled with straw so that the lookout won't freeze to death, and he invites Stephen to go up so that he can see the ice, all the various icebergs and ice flows. With so many officers and hands standing there, Stephen lacks the moral courage (laughs) to refuse, even though the ship is rolling 21 degrees and pitching 12. I've got no clear idea of how they can be so sure in a wooden ship at sea with 19th century instruments while they were pitching exactly 21 degrees and pitching exactly 12. But never mind, never mind. They send Stephen up on a whip, on a rope, with a look of contained horror on his face. Mm. I'm, like, I'm, I'm sure I'm not doing Stephen Matcher any favours when I think, oh, I'm reminded of the rhinoceros in the Ionian mission. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, um, Stephen's up there. Bondon and Weddell steer him through all the shrouds, through the backstays, and he goes through all these reinforcements as Jack goes up on foot and helps Stephen get safely into the nest. And here we have Stephen going through extended torture as payment for his wisecrack about Jack and timidity. Even though it feels to us like payback, it seems that Jack didn't actually intend it to be this way. It's just karma. Um, Jack had meant no harm at all and says that he had just realised that he'd never been aloft when the ship was skittish and hopes it doesn't make him uneasy. Not at all, says Stephen, glancing below and quickly closing his eyes. I like it of all things. Perhaps, Mike, less true words have seldom ever been spoken. (laughs) But as Stephen's kind of manning up here, Jack says, well, it's a shame we can't see very well to the south. How much, says Stephen, are we moving around up here? And Jack says, well, the roll is carrying us 75 feet either way. The pitch is carrying us 45 feet backwards and forwards. A new version of a theme park thrill ride here. Right. And um, Jack says, are you sure it doesn't worry you? Maybe he's thinking that Stephen's about to throw up here. 
never in life, says Stephen, and sneaks a peek <laughs> over the edge again and says, well, do, do ships ever come this way voluntarily? And this is St- Stephen losing a bit of self-awareness here. He had just asked Jack to go further this way the evening before and had called him timid for not making the trip. So again, even, even though Jack's not deliberately rubbing his nose in it, I think fate probably is in some way here. Jack says, well, this route that we're on now is the quickest way from New South Wales to the Cape. But he stops when the view south clears a bit and he can see a nasty blow coming in. And fearing a deadly storm, he orders Bondon to get Stephen down. And now, Mike, all of this preparation, all of the hawsers to the mastheads, all of the heavy weather sailcloth, it's going to come into play here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a cruel, hard Form. And and they're working desperately to claw off from Diego Ramirez the islands with their tall, long rocks. And, and they're trying to get plenty of sea room there because every man aboard, O'Brien writes, dreaded a lee shore more than anything in this world and perhaps in the next. So after such a you know surprisingly lighthearted opening, now we're back to some potential jeopardy here. Yeah. And for nights in the blow, there's this constant violent motion, green seas sweeping the deck fore and aft, no one dry, no one warm, no hot meals, and only a rare hot drink. Ah. Uh, so, my, I was kind of settling into this, expecting that we'd have a long, you know, really drawn out description of the storm. We've had lots of drawn out storms before and really compelling accounts of the danger and the injuries and the, and the misery of it. But actually, the storm clears. And after the storm, they get to beat back westwards again. And there are still some of these blasts of wind. We're still in the 40s and 50s. It's still very, very windy. It turns out that in one of these freakish blasts of wind, they do lose the spare top mast and top gallant masts that are lashed across the spars down on the deck. They blow overboard like a bundle of twigs. Also, the doctor's skiff is destroyed while it's stowed inside the launch, which is untouched. So there's some very freakish ways wow. in which the wind is kind of reaching out and damaging their stuff here. Stephen is not allowed on deck. He watches the apocalyptic scene from a scuttle in the cabin. He's looking out the window and he sees something that he's never seen before. And it's a very Stephen moment for him to see this. There's an albatross flying through the crests, which is surprised by a flying packet of water blown from a cross current and is dashed into the sea. And Mike, we know the importance to sailors and to us in this story of, of albatrosses as, as metaphors for, for fate and safety and seamanship. And this sounds like a very, very grave metaphor to me. An albatross losing its footing, as, you, as it were, and splashing into the sea. The scene goes on. It arose. It arose from the boil with an enormous wing stroke and fled across the face of the rising wave. No sound could, of course, be heard, but Stephen thought he detected a look of extreme indignation on its face. Ah, maybe. (sighs) Sigh of relief. It's going to be okay after all. I suppose we can all conjure up a mental image of what an indignant albatross is going to look like. That's right. Anyway, back on station, it seems that they've brought this really penetrating Antarctic cold with them. Mm. The older hands, especially the ones who are South Seas whalers, look as if it's a mark of far, far worse to come. They know that they're in these cold zones and all of the jeopardy that we've already heard about around ice and you know strong winds and storms, maybe it's creeping into everybody's minds now. The extreme cold... And the unparalleled late summer show of ice means that wherever the winds pause, the air is filled with mist or even fog. So, Mike, we've had albatrosses, fog, winds and cold and the possibility of ice. None of these is sounding very promising for the rest of the voyage of the surprise here. No, no. You know, it's not looking good, but... The day after the full moon, we get the lookout hailing. And this is always, you know, big change, big change. The lookout hails it, right? O'Brien writes, with passionate intensity, sail ho, two sailor ships on the larboard bow. And Jack runs straight from breakfast. He goes aloft, the frost kind of shaking off the rattlings just under his feet. The fog closes back in before he reaches the nest. And the lookout says that the two ships had just cleared the middle islands when he saw them. And it's quiet. Everybody's listening intensely. Time is passing. The sea fog is just resisting the wind. But finally, a gap appears. And three miles to the northeast, Jack sees the two ships. 
They're three to 400 tons, nice stout merchantmen with plenty of room for valuable cargo, and they're moving very, very slowly. One seems about to change course, but the second appears to be hesitating. And Jack's thinking to himself, well, maybe that's the following ship. It hasn't been here before. And sure enough, the leader then fires a gun. All our people look back to see how the following ship responds to the signals. And Jack's thinking, well, you know, maybe they're hard to read in the fog. And Jack is certain, though, that neither of these ships has seen the surprise because it's got so little sail, it's blurred against a gray background and would be virtually invisible to somebody who believes that the closest enemy is 5,000 miles away. Mm. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, Ian, believing that the closest enemy is 5,000 miles away. Okay. I guess that works for everybody, huh? Yeah. (laughs) It's almost like there's there's a competition for who can be most complacent and thereby put themselves at most jeopardy here. Right. Well, seeing where these ships are heading, Jack figures that he can do a little maneuver and try and build his little pot of prizes here. He figures that he can sail east and then steer north to get the weather gauge and then bring them to action whenever he pleases. He wants to see the third ship show up on scene first to be sure that he's got them all out in the open sea with no possibility of returning into the breeze. Quietly then, because they're still potentially within earshot, he has pullings send all the hands to quarters, no drum, no noise, and they make sail as the fog closes around them. The guns are run out silently, the fog closes in, and the sails are set. And like this is back to the this for me this is back to the beginning of the movie and just how eerie right. and unsettling it is being at sea in fog like this three yeah. bells sound and jack immediately says douse the bell we're going to try and run silent here in 15 minutes the breeze changes as jack had expected it would but there's a sudden chill behind them the whalers i think means the, the whalers crew who are aboard the surprise here all look at one another bonden the lookout on the fore shouts Two ships of sail on the larboard beam. No, a brig and a ship. And they're lost back into the mist, these two ships that he sighted. He reports that one was large, topsails and perhaps a forecourse, maybe a ship of the line, perhaps a sloop. And there's this really uneasy silence here. We've got grey trails of mist leaving ice crystals everywhere. Jack, we get reminded for extra jeopardy here that Jack's eye is still injured. So he has to tie a handkerchief over this injured eye that's still watering. The fog parts and all three of the China ships have cleared the island and are well south as he expected. But the two newcomers, the big ship and the brig, even though they're closer and between the surprise and her quarry, are mere looming shapes. We still don't know what they are, what their size and strength or armament is. Awkward Davies is still in complacent mode. He cries out, now there's five of the poor unfortunate buggers. Five, meaning, you know, all the more for us prize takers. And as the crew suppresses Davies, (laughs) Jack spots gun ports on the larger of the two new vessels before it merges back into the greyness and the two forms vanish. Neither of the lookouts or even the experienced Bondin is sure about the size of these vessels. They're clearly moving fast, and they're often between the people and even amongst them, confusing the two ships with each other. Jack suspects that they're Spaniards bound for Valparaiso, and that perhaps the larger one is then headed onto the Philippines. And he's not worried about that row of gun ports he saw, even if there really thinks there may not be guns behind them. You know, merchantmen often use them, real or painted, as a deterrent. Hmm. So again, Jack seeming pretty nonplussed over all this stuff. And we hear, again, sail ho, sail in the starboard bow, sir, called Norton. Jack Whip Brown saw the towering whiteness loom through the mist, thinning over there, and he heard Norton cry, oh no, oh no, sir, I'm sorry, it's an ice island. Yes, and there was another beyond it, with more appearing in the south and the east as the fog grew patchy. And now the particular chill of a breeze blowing off the ice was far more pronounced. And there we end part one of chapter 10. Oh, Mike, feel it, feeling the chills here. We've got cold, we've got fog, we've got an uncertain. What are they? Are they an enemy? Are they all prizes? What are we facing here? 
There's two more ships here. We can't make out who they are. And now we've got an iceberg. And by the way, icebergs are a big part of the some of the danger that Jack and his crew have encountered in the past. It's almost like O'Brien has left this little mini cliffhanger in the middle of the chapter for us here. Thank you, Patrick O'Brien. It's working really well for us. <laughs> right. Oh, man. We talked about how lighthearted the beginning of this chapter was. And all of a sudden, it just seems yeah. like we've just thrown everything into the mix here. Like you said, you know. There are the prizes, but they're over there. There are these two looming ships we can't see. Oh, my God, we got an iceberg right on our tail. And icebergs all around us in thick mist and fog. So we don't know where they are, where we are, where everybody else is here. Ah, And something else that I like about the way the chapter is now turning, he's brought the naval family back together. Yeah. And I think that, that, that heightens our sense of jeopardy a little bit. You know, they're gun room, they're all together. We've had naval banter. We've got stores, we've got seamanship, and it's all shaping up to go. We, we have restored a Jack Aubrey-led naval family of a crew here. And that raises the question, are they going to get through this big situation here with these possible three prizes, possible five prizes, and the icebergs? Or are we going to have one final act of disaster happening? Yeah, it's it's a big chapter. Yeah. It's, it's not where I thought we'd be after chapter nine, but it's an exciting adventure nonetheless, almost kind of like a miniature book in itself as we discover. It is, isn't it? Yeah. As we conclude chapter 10 next week, Ian, what do you say next week to just a little bit more? Patrick O'Brien. Mike, I should like that of all things. Stephen had never, never been aloft when the skip is. <laughs> Here you go, Sam. <laughs> that he'd never been aloft when the ship was skittish and hopes it doesn't make him uneasy.